Okay, it looks like we're live now. Thanks for coming out, Brennan. Brennan Howe is the Technical Manager of Exploration and Ore Body Knowledge at Tech Resources. Prior to joining Tech, he worked for Barrett Gold as a senior geophysicist. He completed a combined Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Commerce in Geology and Finance from the Australian National University. Brendan is a past chair of the BC Geophysical Society. Thanks for joining us again, Brendan. Cheers, Carl. Take it away. Excellent. Well, um, firstly, thanks everyone uh, for attending today. Uh, it's great to see a uh, full room. My first meeting since since before COVID. Um, so really nice to, to come back and, and see everyone's still attending well. Uh, I'm going to give a talk today um, titled Empirical Geophysical Model for Porphyry Copper Deposits in the Laramide Copper Subprovince. In hindsight, it was a really long title. I should have come up with something a bit snappier, uh, but this is what you learn. Uh, and I originally gave this presentation and it's got an associated extended abstract um, at the Australian Earth Science, AEGC, Australian Earth Sciences, Earth and Geological Sciences Convention, I think is the acronym. Gave it in earlier this year in, in March in, in Brisbane. Um, but looking around the room, there's probably nearly everyone's pretty new audience for it. So I uh, don't feel too bad rehashing an old talk. Um, and just to uh, acknowledge my co-author, uh, Sarah DeVries, um, who did a lot of the, the grunt work in, in making some images and diagrams and, and lots of discussions on the topic. Um, so what I mean by an empirical model, so this is is largely just a model that, that um, that we've been sort of applying it at tech and it's empirical in that it's based on observations of geology and observations of geophysics, um, a little bit of petrophysics um, to sort of provide the support for that model, but it's not a, a model based on say inversion modeling or forward modeling in that sense. Um, so it is really empirical. Um, so firstly, Lamaride Copper Province, where are we in the world? Um, so the Lamaride Copper Province, you can see on this map, this is the northern part of it in this grey uh, thick outline here. It, it's, it covers an area that spans into Nevada and California, um, a lot of southern Arizona, a little bit into New Mexico and Texas, and then down into, into Mexico proper, predominantly Sonora. Um, it's it's characterized, why well, it's called the Lamar Copper Province, it's characterized by these late Cretaceous to Paleocene aged intrusions and associated porphyry copper moly deposits. So you can see the ages there, 50 to 75 MA. There's a, a bit of a range um, in ages there. The, the copper deposits, the porphyry deposits in, in the province are typically uh, calcalic in composition. Um, which is important for, for this room as well, because a lot of people might be exploring in, in BC, um, and, and BC has calcalic and alcalic deposits, but a lot of alcalic systems, and that's a bit of a difference. This is dominantly calcalic systems in, in the Laramide. Um, the deposits there, if I'm sort of highlighting some differences from the systems in, in BC, is the, they often have uh, high-grade copper enrichment black in blankets, so supergene blankets or even oxidized or oxide um, zones. And furthermore, uh, a lot of the deposits have tremendous hypergene grades, so greater than 0.7%. These are truly amazing grades. Um, resolution is, is a really famous example of that. It's probably sitting around a percent copper on average. Um, the deposits, and that's these green dots, and I've actually got a few of them named here. Um, something, another characteristic of them, they've been extensively modified by post-mineral uh, deformation. So typically uh, in the Laramide, if you guys know this part of the world, um, in the Miocene, uh, there's it's called the sort of basin and range faulting. So it's an extension and everything started popping up and down and you created like, a range and a basin, a range and a basin. And that has had the effect of concealing deposits. It's also had the effect of like tilting them, dismembering them, et cetera. Um, and you can see that here in this geological map, you can see how we have uh, green or pink 
which is, these are Mesozoic and Laramide intrusions, and these are typically in the ranges. And then this yellowy white color, that's the basin. So you can sort of visualize this up, down, up, down, look across the entire state. Um, and lastly, and probably really importantly for this audience, is that the this this sub province or this this copper province is as greater than fifty percent um, of uh, greater than fifty percent of it is post mineral cover, so it's it's a really well endowed province. It's got a ton of big deposits, yet fifty percent of it's covered. So it speaks just on, on those numbers alone to the potential for undercover discovery and geophysics. Um, in the province. Uh, so just a little bit more on, on why it's such a fantastic place to be. This is a a plot of ages on the x-axis there and um, the copper endowment uh, on the y-axis there. And if you just want to look at some of these numbers, right, like look at the size of these deposits. Marenzi, 7 billion tonnes, 0.4% copper. That, that, that thing is enormous. Um, resolution nearly two billion tons at a percent and a half. Like these, these are insane numbers. It's truly like elephants. Absolutely amazing deposits. Um, so I'm going to sort of switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to firstly just take a little bit of history of um, of exploration models. Let's call them. Um, and first thing I'm going to talk about the the evolution of the the porphyry model, the, ge the, the geological porphyry model, I'm calling it. So porphyry copper systems have been really extensively researched for, for more than 50 years, right? So this is one of the earliest models from, from Lowen Gilbert, 1970, very famous diagram. And it, this sort of descriptive model um, describes this concentric pattern of, of zonation, as this concentric alteration zonation. Um, pattern from sort of propolitic alteration, sericitic to potassic. Um, and it also describes how the sulfides kind of behave as well. So we've got a pyritic shell, and then we grade into zones where you start to see more charcoal pyrite and then more bornite. So these kind of descriptive models um, uh, have been very valuable. Um, you can argue that, but you know, they have been attributed to the discovery of, of several porphyry systems and, and, a, and a really good example of that would be the San Manuel system uh, in Arizona. Um, the model, you know, didn't just stop when these guys published it. Um, it's continued to evolve and, you know, now there's, you know, iterations that include um, super G modifications. This is from a silicone paper. You can see they're including um, uh, leach capping, oxide, Supergene advanced argillic alteration in the model. Um, it's uh, evolved to sort of take into account different um, intrus intrusion chemistry. So this is from Cook et al. and it's a pretty famous diagram. And in the top we've got a uh, a model from an alkalic system, and the bottom is calcalkalic. And don't need to worry about the details, but just to show you that the model is evolving and continuing to be to be fine-tuned depending on where it's being applied and in different circumstances. Um, uh, in addition to the geological models, um, there's sort of been geochemical models that have um, uh, been developed. And this is a really nice example from Halley that talks about um, the pathfinder geochemistry. So you don't need to read the details, but this tells you like where you are in the system vertically and laterally, what kind of uh, the distribution of pathfinder elements, the, the values you might be expecting to see. So these are a really useful models to, to, in the exploration uh, context. Um, and then lastly, the same group, you know, they've even done a similar effort to, to come up with a descriptive model um, based on uh, shortwave infrared or SWIR characteristics. So looking at the wavelength of um, these micas um, in particular. So the point is here, there's, there's been a ton of research and a lot of people looking at coming up with some really great models that, that help explorers. I'm setting the scene here, hopefully. For you. So when I talk about geophysical model, right? This is, um, so what, 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 what comes to mind? And, you know, for me, 
Um, this image, this is from the Alan Brera deposit in South America. Um, in, in my opinion, is probably what most geophysicists carry in their minds when they think about a model for a porphyry deposit. They say, what does a porphyry deposit look like, right? And they go, I might go, ah, oh, you're going to have a, a central mag high. This is like, like the reflecting magnetite addition in the potassic zone. You're going to have this annular donut feature around it, mag low. This is... Um, this is magnetite destruction from likely some sort of hydrolytic or sericitic alteration, something like oxidizing. And then that might grade into a sort of moderate background, typically reflecting an intermediate volcanic host. Um, and that might be it. And that's the kind of idea a lot of people might have in their head. Um, and, and, and that's nearly as descriptive as it gets. And then I said, well, like, what about, I'll go look at another part of the world. This is from North Parks. These are alkalic systems in, in uh, New South Wales and Australia. Um, these lines are draw holes, just ignore them now, but just judging by the density, you can tell where the deposit is. You can see here we've got, these are two small porphyry systems in the North Parks district, and they've got nearly an inverted mag signature. So these are quite simple examples, but I'm, I'm sort of demonstrating the point that, that this model, Clearly, it's not relevant to this model. Um, and then I'll do another example. This is from uh, the Rekadek deposit in Pakistan, an absolute monster of a deposit. Um, Rekadek is a, a cluster of uh, variably mineralized systems, and that's what each one of these black polygons uh, refer to. And I don't want to get in the details too much, but if you look at the resistivity and chargeability data um, in plan, over all these deposits, you see incredibly varying responses. Some are high, some are low, some are moderate, right? Organizing water was sitting in a motorcade outside. And um, I would uh, I, I would say that you would have a, you know, we don't really have formal models like the ones I presented previously that help somebody think about how to interpret these data or how to explore for these systems. Oh. So there has been some attempt at this. <laughs> um, this is and I've sort of this, this is from the Silito paper, nineteen ninety three. Um, it's a pretty simplified model. Um, I would say models like this one that from this paper, they're basically just inferred from geologic observations. So the author, who's a very famous author, knows a lot about porphyries. Um, has just said, well, I know the minerals that I expect to see, and therefore I know some basic knowledge that pyrite's chargeable and magnetite's magnetic, and I kind of expect that this should be the response. But these models like this, in, in this paper, for example, don't have any data to back them up. So I, I think they're a good guide, but I, I don't know how much is actually going behind them. Here's another example. Uh, from Garwin, who did his PhD at, at Bata Hijau, um, and he has seen a lot of data. But this deposit model, this geophysical deposit model, is really only based on Bata Hijau and maybe a lane. So it's based on two systems in a particular tectonic environment, and they're gold rich systems. And again, this probably doesn't really help us explain the, the, the variety of geophysical responses that we might see in another province. And then lastly, this is uh, from a paper from Hubert et al. Uh, did a master's on um, a small system in, in BC somewhere, I can't remember. Um, and again, I, I think this is a, a pretty neat model and I like that the author is, is taking into, into account different erosion levels. However, this model that's published is really only based on this one deposit. Um, and I get, again, I don't think really captures the diversity of responses. Uh, so I, I would I would pose the question, are these models really consistent with all the observed data? And therefore, how useful are they? Um, and I don't want to take back from the, the great work that's been done, but I, I'd say this is a great starting point to think about descriptive geophysical models. So I tried something different in this talk. I put the answer at the start rather than building to it. So a little experimentation going on. So 
this is um, a kind of schematic of my working model um, for the that I think tries to capture the diversity of deposits in the laramide. So we've got a, a pretty cartoony looking geological section here. Um, got some sort of intrusive stock here, the laramide age intrusive. Um, it grades out, uh, it's in the host rock of either uh, these pre cambrian granites, which are pretty common in that part of the world, or there are some limestones around too, Paleozoic limestones. There's a bunch of tertiary volcanics as well in the environment. Um, and then there's areas of cover, some sort of fault down here, creating this little basin. Um, from an alteration perspective, uh, the deposits typically have this sort of case silicate core, grading out to propolytic alteration. They have a, a strong, very strong uh, QSP, serocytic, hydrolytic, I'm using all the terms that people might know, overprint on these deposits. It's actually kind of what makes them a little bit, some of them unique is they have a really intense hydrolytic overprint. Um, that's this, ser this yellow dotted line here, sort of coming over printing things. And then they have, as I mentioned before, often at least originally have supergene mineralization. That's this blue zone. Oxide mineralization, that's this light green zone. And potentially even some sort of leached cap on top. And on this diagram here, I've got, I'll point out two things. So this is the solid line and this dotted line. So this model refers to, if it's solid, this refers to if you had geophysical data collected along the solid line and it's dotted as if this was eroded and that's where your surface was. So it's to take into account where you might be vertically in a system. And I'll take you through it. So from MAG, the models change. So if we uh, had the entire system in place, we get a really nice, quite discreet mag low. And I'll explain why next in the next few slides. So hold on your questions. If we had eroded more deeply down into the system, that mag low will become less pronounced. Chargeability from my piece of it. Um, this is the one that was sort of most surprised me. If we had the entire system intact, to serve it on the top of this, we get a chargeability low over the deposit. So for all the BC explorers here who have, you know, pretty formulaic way of exploring and looking for IP anomalies, um, that would completely not fit. And that's because oxidized ore or oxidized sulfides are, com are completely devoid of IP response. And I'll show you examples of this. If we erode it deeper down, that IP response starts to sort of become flatter and just a broader high reflecting the entire system. Resistivity, so things get really wacky. Um, and resistivity can be galvanic or inductive. Uh, doesn't matter for the purposes of this discussion, really. Um, if we do a, a survey where we have the system not eroded, intact, we get a resistive or a resistor in the data. And that's again, oxide in this part of the world is generally below the water table. The oxide is resistive. If we erode that oxide off and get into more fresh hypergene rocks, we get an inverted response, a quite conductive response. And that's because, as I mentioned, we have this, these typically these strong hydrolytic overprints which bring in a ton of sulfide and they dry, generally drive the, the conductivity, or if there's a bit of chalcosite floating around from the supergene, that will also up the conductivity. Um, so you're, are we allowed to ask a question now? Go for it, So your, your dotted, I mean, the way I read that figure, your dotted line is below the supergene stuff. Yeah, I mean, so that when, that's a boundary, but the supergene zone, in reality, there'll be a transition. It won't be a hard, a hard boundary. And I was too lazy to put in 10 different levels. Okay. No, okay, because yeah. I mean, you know, like calcocyte is phenomenal conductor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if the surface picked up a calcocyte. Sorry? I said if the surface survey picked up a calcocyte. Yep. Like happened at um, Eugenia. Yep. 
you would get a scream and low in the risk statement. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about the mag. So I kind of gave you a model before. So what's going on with the mag? Why are we getting these mag lows? Um, firstly, there are, my interpretation I should have caveated all everything before these my interpretations. <laughs> um, the Lamoish age felsic intrusions, they're really characterized by low susceptibility. So they're, they're, they're very poor or low magnetite in the protolith. So they're typically monzonites, um, the productive phase in the Lamoish, and they just don't have much magnetite to begin with. So that's part of the reason. And I think I'm hopefully going to show you this in this image here. This is from the Res uh, Globe Miami district. And these rocks here, these, these reds with the little crosses, this is the Schultz granite, very important Lamoish age rock. Um, and I've got the outlines of the Schultz granite highlighted here in the regional mag. Um, and you can see quite a nice correlation with the mag low there and the Schultz granite. And then, um, you know, we have over in the north, we have the ruined granite, which is Precambrian, and it's a mag high. So it's got different composition, it's got more magnetite. So the host intrusions don't have much magnetite to begin with. That's Reason number one. Um, the the and I go. I'll show you this again in this next slide from Marenzi. So this is, yeah, I've changed areas. We've gone from Globe Miami to the Safford District, and this is the Marenzi deposit here. And I've, hopefully you can see this well. This is geology with mag kind of transparent, superimposed on it. This purple unit is the the outline of the Laramide intrusion at Marenzi, and you can see, at least in my mind, a really nice match between the extents of that intrusion and that beautiful subcircular mag low. It's, it's, it's really characteristic. Um, so furthermore, as I said, like the, the intrusion center much magnetite, but then we've also brought in a lot of hydrolytic alteration, this serocytic alteration, which if there was any magnetite there, it's going to flush it all out. So you have these two factors making it very difficult to, to drive a strong mag response. And then lastly, we might have thick oxide on top, but we might even bury these. So I, these are sort of all the reasons why I think that they're mag lows. Um, talk about the exceptions, because there always are. Um, we do get some exceptions, and these are typically when they're in the presence when these, when these porphyry deposits are intruding into the paleozoic carbonates and we generate scans. So there's a really nice example from New Mexico, um, the Santa Rita deposit, or uh, another name is Chino, this deposit. And this is great because you see this mag anomaly down here, that's the outline of the, the pit. Um, really strong mag anomaly. This is uh, magnetite uh, as a result of, of contact metasomatism, making a scan, making a lot of magnetite. Then we have this little pinprick dot in the middle. That's where you've got the porphyry still. So it's still a mag low, surrounded by that strong mag high. So we can have some exceptions, um, but we have to think about like, okay, why do we have an exception? If we are targeting a mag high, why? We've got to go, well, what's different? Um, talk about, I missed a slide. Here, I forgot to point this out, sorry. No, no, I must have hit it twice. Back to my point about the intrusions being having not much magnetite. This is from a paper from 1966, a really great compilation from Brandt. And he, uh, the authors pulled together mag sus from a bunch of different intrusive rocks in the district. And I'm just highlighted here in bold um, the laramide aged intrusions, so the Schultz granite, we talked about that before, and quartz monzonite, San Manuel, and another monzonite porphyry in the Ray in Ajo. Rancy deposits. And look, so look at these numbers. These are 10 to the minus six, by the way, SI. So they're pretty small numbers. Now, if we look at the rest of the numbers, so we've got this tertiary granite diorite, much bigger. The diabases, they can get really strong. Um, the Precambrian rocks in the hundreds. So we're getting orders of magnitude variation um, between a lot of the, the other intrusive rocks and the Laramide age rocks. So sorry about that. I should have said that before. Um, okay, switch gears and talk about IP. Um, this is a great uh, 
a paper from Nelson and Johnson, 1994, and they're presenting here um, some wireline logging data through the Santa Cruz deposit, something that Ivanhoe are currently busy drilling out. Um, but it's one of the actually few papers you can actually find in literature which shows you resistivity data and IP data, wireline data, so in situ data, and compares it to at least observed abundance of various supergene minerals and oxide minerals. So um, the oxide, so the supergene minerals would be chalcosite, for example, so this one here, and the chrysocola atacarmite would be more the, the oxide minerals. Okay, so it's, I know it's little, so just keep an eye on these things. And the IP data is this uh, log here. And what we see in the IP response of the oxide, so we've got the oxide peaks here in the minerals, is a negligible to no IP response whatsoever. Okay, that makes sense. Like we had sulfides, but we blast them with oxides, and we know sulfides, a lot of iron, they like to rust. So there's nothing crazy here. But it's nice to see that in these data. Uh, the supergene minerals, so the chalcosite, these little peaks here, I know it's hard to see on this plot, but they're typically associated with these really discrete um, highs in the IP. So IP data, oxide rocks, no IP response. Supergene rocks, IP response. And this doesn't go much deeper into the deposit, but I will show you at least in section that um, hydrolytic alteration of the hypergene rocks is can be very strong in terms of chargeability. And this is what I'm going to show you now. So this is a 2D IP uh, inverted model from a frequency domain survey across, I think it's Marenzi again. And I think this really uh, demonstrates everything I was showing you on the, on the previous slide. So um, IP model, very low values, zero, it's dead at the surface. That grades into quite a strong response, greater than 30 milliradian response at depth. Uh, this is a model of the different ore types from Marenzi. Uh, so basically the green is this hypergene sulfides. And the green, very strongly chargeable. As we move up vertically, in the, upwards in the system, and we move from hypergene into this orange and blue zones. So the orange is the leach cap, the blue is oxide ore. We correspondingly move into the, the dead IP response. So what we're seeing in that, in that wireline log with the IP, I'm, I'm showing you here with, with field data. Next slide. And here is another example from the Safford deposit, just down the road from this one, Marenzi. Um, this is, again, a, a, a frequency domain IP survey, long, quite a long section going across the deposit. And what's been superimposed on this section, it's kind of a bit messy, but is, is, is this blue is from their 3D model of the different ore types at the Safford deposit, is we have the blue is the, the logged oxide from the model, and the orange is the sulfides. And you can see this tremendous low really corresponding quite nicely with that mapped oxide zone. So again, I think I'm trying to show the same point that the, the, in the IP response, the oxides are low and then they grade into stronger anomalies when we get into the sulfide or the hypergene response and very strong numbers. Okay. Resistivity. So I'm going to go back to this great plot from Nelson. Um, this time we're going to talk about this plot, uh, the, the wildlife resistivity data, and we're going to look at those same minerals. So uh, in the oxide minerals are associated with this, um, this peak here, this strong resistive response. That little peak right there lines up perfectly with where we get the uh, oxide ore. The supergene ore, where we got these chalcosite responses, we get these drops 
and resistivity. Um, so the conductive. And I'm going to show you that, I hope, uh, in a couple of examples uh, of field data. So this is a plan map of ZTEM data. It's a total phase rotated data, maybe 30 hertz or something. I can't remember. It's not super important right now. Over the Lone Star, which is another name for the SAPID deposit. And that was that one before. I'll go back. That was this. So that plan section is cutting right through this model and we see in the center this uh cool cool colored blue this, this re re reflecting resistive um a resistive response and this ring around it of high uh conductive response and that's exactly where we have the oxide zone in the center surrounded by the the, the sulfide or hypogen zone around the outside on the to a bit of a different style of response. This is uh, a section through the resolution deposit. This is a very deep deposit. Um, resolution doesn't have any oxide or supergene really, but it does have a ton of sulfide in the, um, in the hyper hypergene. Um, and I've got on here, this is a 1% copper shell on the section. The copper shell sitting on top of that copper shell is a really thick zone of pyrite up to sort of 5% pyrite shell in the immediate hanging wall of the copper. And these are, on this section, these are isosurfaces from a 3D inversion of a Z10 survey again. And I think you can see the numbers. I mean, they're not crazy conductive, but they're more conductive than everything around them. And here, the conductivity from the Z10 picks up really nicely the, the response from the deposit and that hanging wall strong pyrite zone. So the hypergene mineralization is really conductive here. In contrast to Safford, where the you have this resistive response. So I hope you, I, I'm hopefully trying to build the story that you have to have a really good understanding of where you are vertically in the system, or what you might be expecting to, to understand the results because you have definite implications into your targeting. If you had this kind of idea in your head, so I'm looking for resolutions, and you had these data, you might drill out here and miss the really good oxide part of this system, for example. Or if you had this in your mind, you might miss, miss this completely. Um, and then here's a, another example. So that's a, this is a IP survey, um, from this deposit here, Lone Star, Safford, um, that are cutting across this, something like that. Uh, red colors are conductive, blue are resistive. And I, you're seeing in section what I was demonstrating there in the plan Z10, that resistive zone, the copper oxides and the sulfides around the outside and at depth. So um, sort of covered a bit of ground there. And this is my attempt to try and build a kind of a, a useful, maybe, <laughs> uh, exploration or geophysical model to help explore in the district. So um, you have common data sets might be available, and I've you know I've simplified things, but you know if you this is if you've got a response it was a mag high or a mag low or IP high, low or resistor or conductor. And if you have these kinds of responses, this is what they might be reflecting. Right? So, oh, we got a mag high. Well, okay, that's okay. We can have a mag high that's a target, but we probably need to consider that if we there's a scan around, this might be a good thing. Or that we might be really deep in the system. Uh, we've got a discrete low. We talked about that. And same with IP and resistivity. Um, what I'm sort of covering here in the top of this uh, model is the effect of post-mineral cover. I didn't really talk about that, but if you do have post-mineral cover, this is what is likely going to do to each one of these methods. Obviously, potential field data. We're going to attenuate the response. Everyone's got a pretty good understanding of that. Um, 
with IP, we're going to get limited depth penetration, especially if it's conductive cover, we might not get much signal down through that. And with EM data or resistivity data, the cover can be conductive, so we can get false positives just as a result of the cover. Um, and then the last part of this model is the erosion level. So depending on how much, if you go back to that section, where you, how much of the system you think is intact, where you are vertically, I've colored up the responses. And I think that's it. So yeah, questions? None? I think you're pretty brave, isn't it? With, uh, with some tech <laughs> <laughs> well There's a neat graph from this Nelson and Word, this paper, the yep. 80s, where they yeah. plot resistivity against percent sulfide. Yep. Right? And if it's less than a half, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just the host it, rock. And if it's greater than seven or eight, it's nice and conductive. And there's a nice linear. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it goes like this. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that you know that would be a good conclusion because that that backs up the story of these, the the hypergene being conductive, right? Because you get yeah. a ton of sulfide in there. Yeah. yeah. And then um, I guess we all whenever everyone talks about porphyry, they're always standing up. So if these things are up around their side. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So that we'd have to yeah do some. Yeah, I mean it's a you know it's impossible to put every. Think of every combination, but it's something that you. No, I mean that could be on its side. They're looking for these things, right? I mean, what if, you know, what if, what if this is on the side? I mean, it would be really neat. Has anyone done a geophysical line over Yarrington? The only Yarrington stuff I've seen. There's a paper in by Hunter Ware, geophysics in the seventies. Awesome paper, um, and they did in situ mag and IP measurements on the pit floor. At like some super high resolution. That's so they, what Nelson and Glenn Boris did, like meter. Yeah, they did like a little gradient survey, yeah. and the, the detail is stunning in that that Hunter Ware paper. Yeah. Um, but it gives you know, Yarrington's been mined for so long that there's no data of it really, because there was no need to go collect the data. Awesome. So oh, question. no. Yeah, I just thought I was going to get out of here. Uh, what does it do for the economics of your mind when you have several different ore types? Yeah, it's good. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I make some general comments that um, oxide and supergene generally good things for the economics of the mind. It um, definitely enhances uh, enhances the economics. Like typically, the grade is so with supergene, the grade is typically higher. And with oxide, it's much easier to process. You don't have to do oxide as well. You can throw you can throw acid. Exactly. You don't have to have a flotation plant and do all this stuff. So, and then lastly is because these things are on top of the porphyry. From a mining point of view, they get to or well, they need to move less material to get to it. So the economics work really favorable because the, the strip ratio is less. And they're getting into ore sooner. So these things are you know, really favorable. Characteristics is part of the reason why a lot of these deposits are so big there. And yeah. Because the different ore types are exploitable. Yeah. Right. Okay. I was going to ask is um, have you done or would you see much value in you know, building up perhaps a library or some examples that you could run for bottle Absolutely. Yeah. Is that something you've started to explore or? No, I mean, it's a dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, a dream would be that to have um, some, I kind of think of it like the, um, what's it called? You know, in, in the SEG with the oil and gas, they've got those yeah, models. Like what's the it? Seam. Seam, thank you. Yeah. Like, I, I, these are like some really good models, not like simple blocks, but some really good models. That geometrically are, are accurate. That's the first part of the dream. The second part would be to populate it with really good physical properties. So two things are very difficult to do, but um, you can really start playing games when you have that. The best at UWA. 
I think we met Mark Jessup. I think he's got some, right? Doesn't he have some sort there, of it, in geological model. He's doing it from a geological like a, it's like yeah towards a, a like stochastic kind of modeling thing. and yeah. stuff like that with it. So yeah. yeah, I mean they they're starting to work on the modeling part of it, but, but yeah. But they're starting to build a library of responses yeah. of you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, something that'd be super valuable because you can start like answering Joel's question down there and turn it up here and chop it up and or remove yeah. this or carve a surface or just tweak it, change this. Um, I think you could, that would be super. That's sort of the next level of really learning about these things. You didn't talk about radio metrics. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's simple story. The top thirty centimeters. Um, I mean, it's, I, I think it's a pretty simple story. Potassium high. There's, there's the potassium is generally in the in the sericites for potassium. All this potassium in 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 the K feldspar in the in the potassic alteration. Um, standard tricks from BC, you normalize it by thorium, you get a nice low it's sort of meant to, to point you at potassium addition versus just general high levels of potassium. And these things are generally covered and if they're oxidized, it's a bit different. Right? Yeah, Sorry, anyway, we we'll, we'll have a beer afterwards so we're going to continue chats and discussions. Hopefully, we have it. Are we still doing beers? We can depend on the beers, yeah. And now we changed spot, but it's going to be. Yep. It's like on the. Uh, I, mean, I can't remember the name. We'll get it used to water, water hole. We're not going, we're not going to the Australian yeah. pub anymore? They have karaoke and that's going to shut the hands down. Okay, I never like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Okay, thanks again. Yeah. Oh, we didn't ask for questions from the audience. No, that's right. Yeah. Is there someone in the audience? Uh, Tibo says thank you. Anyone in the audience want to ask something? We still have fun. 20 people still online. Oh, Doug's here. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that was that was really that was really interesting, Brendan, but it just yeah, it just points out the complexities of this. And, you know, Lindsay asked about, you know, getting some, uh, maybe some type models, but, you know, where, where, where do we go? I mean, are, are the geologists and, you know, geochemists, uh, are, are they developing dynamic models that, you know, one could at least start to work with? Or, I mean, how, how do we put all this stuff together and do something that, is really useful. Yeah, it's a, a great question, Doug. I mean, um, typically you, this is very siloed information, right? Like every mining company has, a, um, they'll have a great model of their own deposit and they won't share it, right? So, um, and as, so to some extent, no. Um, Joel did mention there is a group at UWA who, who might be playing around in this space, Mark Jessel. Um, Lorena Lears, he's not at UWA, but he's a, a colleague of, of of Mark's from Monash University. That would probably be the closest to doing this style of thing that you where you're getting at with that. Um, well, don't get to say you're down the hall from MDRU. You shouldn't be asking us. You should be asking, <laughs> they, they asking them, right? They're having their day. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but the physical properties part of it is, you know, the model's only half the story, right? And the model's going to be only as good as the physical properties you put into it. Um, and uh, I, yeah, that's a really a much more tricky conversation. Um, so it's not just about building the canonical and morphing and chopping it. The, it's also variable. Yeah, well, what numbers are you going to put in there? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess it was Joel was talking about um, uh, you know, altering, you know, just geometrically, like um, uh, Mount Milligan, right? It was a porphyry, and then it's tilted at yeah, forty-five or sixty degrees on the side, and that really throws a kibosh into things, also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think we just kind of do that arithmetic in our heads in a way but it's, you know, try and squint and look at the data and <laughs> get creative but yeah totally totally agree Doug 
Anyone else? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Bye.